you say it was going to be perfect getting it recorded so good well i appreciate um appreciate catherine you inviting me to do this presentation and i hope i hope everyone gets a little bit a little bit of something out of it and uh enjoys it feel free to jump in if you ever have questions or you know want to discuss anything um I, I know there'll be a little bit of time at the end for questions as well, so feel free to jot them down and, and uh, let me know what you think. So I'm going to first start off a little bit, talk about myself. Uh, my name is Tom Kading. I work for a company called Fargo Patent and Business Law. Um, we're a law firm. There's seven of us, so we're based in Fargo, North Dakota. We have a branch office in Southern California, uh, Murrieta, also known as the Inland Empire, so that's located between san diego and los angeles we're doing a slow growth down there and we're growing growing rather quickly so it's been a fun market to be in fun to uh kind of really focus on our area of expertise and uh and just uh engage with uh, innovators to really help them grow what our mission is is we help innovative businesses and inventors uh, develop opportunities by protecting their assets and my core fundamental belief. So I'm a, um, my background is business. I, I was involved in a number of startups, a number of different ventures before I got into private practice. And, you know, my, my belief is, you know, you can spend a lot of money on IP, you can spend a lot of money on attorneys, but you have to have a good business plan to back it up. And that's why, you know, I want to not just service, you know, IP, patents, trademarks, et cetera also want to take care of some of those ancillary business issues because I believe that it's it's so closely tied together. So Fargo Patent and Business Law, a little bit of disclaimer, each of your situations may be, you know, specialized to you, special facts. This is just educational purposes only, so I'm not your attorney in this situation. A um, little bit about myself. I, I mentioned I came from a business background. So some of the Activities I've been involved with Fargo Patent Business Law, obviously Precision Venture. Precision Venture was a, a fund I started during law school, uh, ended up raising a bunch of capital from different investors, got into some technology projects, got into uh, cryptocurrency, CBD, manufacturing automation, also heavy in, into the real estate world. So housing bubble popped. 2008, hit the bottom in 2011, ended up buying a couple hundred homes in the Southern markets, rolled those markets up and exited as planned. So it was kind of had a different approach to get getting into law, uh, prayer products, rocks renovation. I owned a construction company for, for a couple of years, ended up uh, getting rid of that. That was in Arizona. I've been involved in, uh, different uh, real estate holdings, REITs, Edward REIT, uh, Ledger Petroleum, uh, Texas Oil Company. So I've, I've kind of gotten exposure to a lot of different activities out there, which uh, certainly helps with the legal representation side. I've really, you know, enjoyed not just using a legal knowledge, but also using uh, business knowledge, because I think it's it's so tied together. Educational background, been in North Dakota for quite a while. Uh, NDSU, went to NDSU for civil engineering. I got my MBA and my law degree at UND, started businesses then, also got involved in politics, was elected in 2014 to the state house, re-elected in 18, but I'm not running again this year. And part of that is, I need to focus on one thing, do one thing really well. It's hard to do a ton of different things at once. So that's one of the struggles I've had to go through is really learning to focus on what's most important in terms of business, that is. And, you know, I'm focused on IP, Fargo Patent Business Law. So Fargo Patent Business Law, you know, I call us IP plus. So we're intellectual property plus some business. We do patents, IP, that's patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. The business side includes contracts, uh, entities, you know, if you want to set up an LLC, a corporation, that sort of thing, and then exempt securities. Exempt securities are activities like, hey, I started a restaurant, I want to bring on a partner, and they're going to kick in some money, I'm going to run the operation. That's a security. 
And if you don't handle securities correctly, you can get in a lot of trouble. If you look at law, you kind of can break it into, at least business law, that's my focus. You can break it into four categories. This is just what I, I break it into. There are different ways to break it into different things and some people do it differently than me, but this is how I do it. I look at business law basically in four ways. You have tax law, employment law, corporate law, and intellectual property. Now intellectual property, that's our space. And also some corporate law. And you know, the contracts, entities, that sort of thing. We don't touch tax law. We barely touch employment law. We touch employment law when it comes to non-disclosures or you know what what kind of rights does the employee have versus the employer when it comes to intellectual property. So we're pretty limited in that scope. But the main thrust of today's conversation, I want to talk about Lego. And you know, I think Lego Lego is a cool brand. Kind of has some some fun activities. I also think it's a great example for um, business entities and intellectual property. Now, I I also think Lego is cool. You know, my uh, kids and I we had a little bit of fun. This is our kitchen table. Put together a couple Lego trains and and we had fun with it. So I think Lego is fun to talk about, but it's also a great example for um, IP and business law. And one of the other reasons IP is, you know, an interesting company is I, I've dealt with Lego directly. So I, I've had clients who've run across Lego and uh, Lego is a very aggressive in protecting their IP. And they protect their copyrights, they protect their trademarks, they protect their, you know, their patents. And I'm sure they check, protect their trade secrets. I haven't dealt with them in the trade secret front, uh, but they are very very aggressive in making sure that their image is protected and they've been very successful at it. They've done a ton of litigation and a ton of enforcement. So it's a great example. Now Lego, uh, Lego doesn't mess around. Uh, you'll see in this slide, you'll see two pictures. You'll see on the left side of the screen, there's a traditional Lego. Lego has a product line called Technic. And that's just one of their trademark product lines. So you see this Lego Technic uh, car on the left. It's a, it's a picture of the box and you build the, build the car itself. And then on the right, you'll see a brand and it's, in, it's a Chinese brand. And it's, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's Le Pen or Le Pen. I don't, don't know the exact pronunciation, but Le Pen was knocking off Lego. And you can see in these two pictures, the, the Lego image is almost identical to the knockoff image. And Lego was not too happy about it. And, you know, they sold, I think it was like 4.2 million boxes of, you know, these knockoff products that were directly like Lego, very similar. And so Lego, Lego kind of got fired up about it and they ended up getting into all kinds of litigation. And, you know, lo and behold, Lego ended up convincing the Chinese government, Shanghai, uh, that these people were doing something criminal, not just civilly wrong, not just infringing on their trademark, but also something that was criminal. So the CEO ended up getting a six year sentence in prison. Um, Eight other people ended up going to prison. So it was, a, it was a pretty severe example of trademark infringement in this case. So, so that's kind of what they got them on, trademark and copyright infringement. So in this case, you know, the Lego, the red square in the top left corner looks almost identical to the, you know, the red square in the top, top right, left of the knockoff. Same with Technic, Technician. The blue, you know, it's it's very confusingly similar. So Lego ended up winning that case and ended up getting a couple people to actually go to jail over that. Now this is a Chinese example. Um, ended up doing go to prison in China and enforce it in China. In the U.S., it's it's probably not going to happen that you end up going to jail over a trademark infringement or copyright infringement. I suppose you could if you did contempt of court. Um, 
but it goes to show that these companies out there, they're, they're serious about protecting their brands and their brands are worth a lot of money to them. So they, Lego is an example of a company that enforces their rights. So now, you know, when you deal with law in the US, you really deal with two different categories. You deal with uh, state law and federal law. And generally speaking, those are the different categories. There's, there's other jurisdictions out there. There's water districts and cities and counties and different things like that. But generally speaking, when you come to um, the type of law we typically practice, is it's either state law or federal law. Uh, state law, you start a business, you're typically dealing with state law. State law are things like the Secretary of State. Secretary of State of North Dakota, you go and file your LLC in North Dakota, or you could go to Minnesota and file your LLC there, Secretary of State of Minnesota. And you know each state has some variation of a Secretary of State where you go and file a company. Some states have you know, the Arizona Corporation Commission or, you know, different different things where you file, file your LLC or your corporation or your partnership or whatever it might be. So that's state law. State law also typically includes property sales, uh, real estate sales, um, employment law. Uh, it includes like um, family law or, you know, some of the more typical uh, legal and lawyer type things. Now, federal law, that's that's where intellectual property mostly sits. You can do state-based intellectual property, but it's much more common to look at federal intellectual property. An example of that is trademarks. So you can get a trademark in the state of North Dakota, you need a trademark at the federal level. A federal trademark protects you in all 50 states. A state trademark protects you in North Dakota. Um, Typically the cost is about the same. So our recommendation is always, almost always I should say, uh, go and get a federal trademark. It's gonna give you much more protection and uh, it's gonna be about the same cost. So federal law, that's trademarks, it's patents. USPTO, US Patent and Trademark Office, that's where you get trademarks and patents. Uh, the US Copyright Office, that's where you go and get copyrights. Typically, we, we as a firm, Fargo Patent and Business Law, we, we deal more with the USPTO. Uh, we do copyrights, but we really don't market it that much. Um, kind of our, our focus is certainly on the patent and trademark front. A little bit about, about LEGO. So what is LEGO? Uh, LEGO is an abbreviation for a, a Danish word, I believe it is. And it, I don't have no idea how to say it, but it's like got, and what that means is um, play, play well. So it's just an abbreviation, kind of a play on words. Now it's a Denmark based company, it's overseas. So the headquarters was in Europe. That said, it has a ton of US entities. It even has North Dakota entities. It has entities probably in all 50 states, but the bulk of their entities really are in Delaware. A lot of Delaware entities and Delaware is, you know, people who are starting businesses, you probably heard of Delaware corporations, Delaware, for a couple of reasons, that's the go-to state. So most publicly traded companies are Delaware companies. And that's because there's a lot of case law. There's a lot of standardized systems for, for Delaware corporations. So that's why a lot of companies go to Delaware, set up their entity there. Uh, if you're going to start a restaurant in North Dakota, you're going to start, you know, a, a real estate company, a manufacturing in North Dakota. Most of the time I say start a North Dakota LLC. Um, it's probably not worth the expense of setting up in Delaware. If you're going to go out and you're going to raise $100 million in capital and you plan on doing all sorts of expansion and and grow through, throughout the United States, yeah, let's, let's consider a Delaware company. But generally, small business doesn't necessarily have to worry about that. Lego was founded in 1932. And like I said, they're in Delaware, but their headquarters are in Connecticut. So one of the things as you get into business and you learn about business is, you know, what do you do when you start a North Dakota company, North Dakota LLC, for example, 
but now they want to go do business in South Dakota. I want to have my North Dakota base, but I'm going to have a branch in, in South Dakota, and I'm going to have a storefront there. Well, what you have to do is you have to file in South Dakota as a foreign entity. So you have your North Dakota entity, but you also file in South Dakota and say, hey, Secretary of State in South Dakota, I'm doing business down here. Uh, just letting you know, I want to do it legally. And that's, that's essentially what you're doing when you're filing as a foreign entity in another state. So that's what happened with Lego. They have their entity in Delaware. They have a probably a foreign company in Connecticut. They probably have a bunch of local Connecticut companies as well because the organizational structures for uh, big companies can get very complicated. You can have 50 LLCs doing different things. An example of that, when I was running Precision Venture, we had about 18 different entities doing different purposes. So they'd invest in different projects, they'd do different services. So depending on what your business is, you may or may not need uh, different entities doing different things. The core, uh, I guess our top entity in, in the US is Lego Systems Inc. I did a search in Delaware just out of curiosity and wanted to see, you know, how many entities do they have? And I did a simple search and this is just a small portion of what they have. But you can see there's all sorts of entities here. There's corporations and LLCs and you know, LP. Um, LLCs and, and corporations are the most typical. Uh, there's even a trust, trust in here, which is another type of entity people use. But if you think, but with entities, you know, you saw these different types of entities. You saw LLCs. You saw corporations. But what you didn't see is partnerships and sole proprietorships. And one of the reasons that is, is if you go out and start a business, you have two choices, or two basic choices, I should say. Um, you can limit your liability one, or you can have personal liability. And as an attorney, I always tell people, you wanna limit your liability. And the way you do that is with an LLC or a corporation most of the time. You can also do that with uh, limited partnerships or limited liability partnerships or you know, a couple of different entities out there, but typically it's an LLC or a corporation. You know, as I showed you in the last slide, we didn't see straight up partnerships and we didn't see sole proprietorships. So what a partnership is, is two or more people or businesses or whatever come together and they say, hey, we wanted to, we want to do business. We want to start a business and they sign up the two people start a restaurant and it's a partnership something goes wrong with the restaurant uh, the creditors anyone who's suing you they're going to go after you personally and they're not just going to go after the business itself you're personally on the hook and that's the same thing with sole proprietorships if you start up a a um, you know a food truck and you say hey i'm just going to do it in my own name if something goes wrong if you you know, horrifically poison someone, they're coming after you personally and they're suing you personally. So that's why I always say set up an LLC, set up a corporation. It gives you some insulation for some of these things. It mitigates that risk. Uh, you know, another risk, so an LLC, a corporation can, you know, provide you for some protection, uh, but it's not perfect. And one of the other ways someone can get through that limited lab liability protection, they can pierce the corporate veil. That's one way we can talk about that. Um, but, but a different way is if you violate securities law. And a lot of times in North Dakota, small business doesn't necessarily understand uh, what securities are and how that might be violated. So in North Dakota, um, what the, what the law says is if you offer a security and you don't do it properly, you don't follow the law, every sale made in violation, every director, officer, or agent is jointly and severally liable to recover the full amount paid. So let's say you start a restaurant 
your friend comes along and says, I want to put $20,000 into it. You run the business and I just throw in some cash. And you, and, you know, you've operated for a year already and you say, okay, I'll bring on a partner and I'll do that. You're taking on a security. So regardless as to if you have an LLC in place and something goes wrong, that person, that investor may have recourse under this law. So you have to be careful when it comes to securities. Um, in North Dakota, you can qualify for what's called an exempt security. In many cases, exempt securities, um, there's a bunch of different ways. But an exempt security is essentially, um, it occurs when you bring on an accredited investor. A accredited investor is someone who is makes more than uh, $200,000 single and has a net worth over uh, a million, for example. There's a number of different ways you do it. It can get very complex. I'm not gonna go over all the different ways to, to abide by securities law, but be careful if you're taking money from someone else, from an investor, whether it's in the form of a, a loan or the form of a, you know, equity investment into your company, be very careful because you're likely dealing with the security. And if you don't register it with the state, you may end up being personally liable if something goes wrong. So be careful. Uh, let's see, move it on. So, so let's move on to intellectual property. So I wanna talk about Lego's uh, patents, their trademarks, their copyrights and trade secrets. And I also wanna give a very um, brief precursor as to what are these things. So a patent, a patent, is the ability to prohibit others from making, using, selling a concept. So you apply for a patent with the USPTO and the USPTO says, okay, your idea is novel. It's not obvious, it's useful. Therefore, we're gonna give you a patent. And what that patent says is you have the exclusive right to this particular concept for the next 20 years. So it's a legal monopoly in itself. It doesn't mean you have the right to do it, it just means you have the right to exclude others from doing it. Um, the next thing is trademarks. So trademarks are a type of intellectual property. Trademarks are um, the ability to prohibit others from using a name, a design, expression that defines the source of a brand. So previous example, we've talked about Lego, we talked about their logo, we talked about their name, um, we talked about the word Technic. Those are all trademarks. So Lego has a, a uh, trademark, that red square. Lego has a trademark for the, the word Lego. Lego has a trademark for the word Technic. And trademarks can be names, they can images that can even be sounds, but there's something that uniquely identifies the source of a particular product or service. A copyright, a copyright is the right to control the reproduction, publishing, selling, or distribution of a work that's placed on a tangible form. So examples of that include um, paintings or songs or, or um, you know, books, pictures, that sort of thing. And then there are trade secrets. Trade secrets are basically a legal way to keep a secret of something that has a commercial uh, value. So if you follow the rules when it comes to a trade secret and someone somehow steals it from you, you have recourse under the law to say, hey, you stole it from me. And even though you know it, you can't use it. And in Lego's case, they probably have all four. So these are, you know, four types of IP. These are the, the typical four types of IP, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. And that's when people talk about IP, that's typically what they're talking about. Uh, so let's talk trademarks. What is a trademark? You know, it's a sign, design, name, expression, could be a saying, could be a lot of things, but it represents the product and service. You can oftentimes see a trademark with the, the mark TM or the circle around an R, those oftentimes indicate a trademark. Technically, what the R is, it means it's a registered trademark. And that means 
you know, you file it with the USPTO, USPTO has reviewed it and said, okay, we're giving you a trademark and it's therefore registered. And then you have the rights as a registered trademark. TM can sometimes mean a, a, a common law trademark. It can mean a trademark that's been applied for, but not yet granted. So one of the, one of the distinctions with trademarks is a trademark can't have a technical function. So if a trademark has something it actually does, you probably can't get a trademark on it. Example would be um, a special shape of a wrench. You might not be able to get a trademark on a special shape because it actually has a function. And Lego dealt with that as well, and we'll touch on that in a minute. But uh, here's a couple examples of Lego trademarks. You'll see, you know, Technic, Bricklink. Those are word trademarks. They just trademark the name. So if if a business comes in and says, "Hey, you know, I want to, um, I want to get a trademark for my business," you know, typically what I say is the first trademark you want to get is the name. The second trademark is your logo, black and white, and the third trademark your logo and color. You might want to get a trademark on your slogan, but you know, not everyone has endless budgets. So the first thing you really want to focus on is the name itself. Um, but you'll see a couple of trademarks here. You see some logos, the logo, the red Lego, that's a logo, the Duplo, that's a, that's a logo. Um, City, that's a logo. Um, one of the interesting things you'll see here is the Lego man. So that's a, that's a trademark in itself. That's actually a 3D trademark, which is a little bit of a unique thing. Um, I did a little bit of research. I think Lego owns around 80 different registered trademarks in the US. So they, again, they're very aggressive with their IP. Now here's a something Lego tried to apply for as a trademark. And I believe they actually got this as a trademark, but this brick. So the, the uh, Lego had a, a patent on the brick itself. It was something that was new, something that was useful and not obvious at the time. And this was back, I think in the 50s, if I recall correctly. But they got a patent on this at the end of the patent. They said, well, we really like having our monopoly. So let's get a trademark on our brick too. And, you know, see if we can exclude the competition like that. So the trademark filed their application. They got their trademark. Um, they ended up going to litigation. Someone said, hey, that's not fair. You shouldn't have a trademark on this brick. It has a technical function. And so it went to court and the court ended up saying, yes, the Lego brick has a technical function and therefore Lego, you cannot have a monopoly over the Lego brick because it's not a valuable trademark and your patent has expired. Uh, so now today in the market, we'll see all kinds of competition to the Lego trade, the Lego brick. Now, I don't know all the brands off, off the top of my head, but there are many brands out there that uh, create variations of Legos. So there's competition in the market and you can buy other Lego bricks. Now, if you look at the Lego minifigure, that's a different story. Same thing, you know, Lego like their minifigure and said, hey, you know, this is a great thing. I want to continue my monopoly. And again, they went out, they got a trademark and they aggressively enforced their trademark. Ultimately, they got in litigation and, you know, the courts ended up making a decision and the court said, no, this does not have a technical function. Um, this is a valid 3D tr trademark. So the court said, yep, your, your Lego minifigure, that's trademarked and Lego can prohibit other people from dealing with the Lego minifigure. And I've dealt with this situation uh, before in my uh, work, you know, defending people against Lego saying, hey, you're ripping off our minifigure, quit doing it. So when it comes to trademarks, you know, if you get sued for trademark damage, um, you know, if you're an infringer, you might have to pay actual damages, uh, discouragement of profits, and even possibly attorney fees and costs. It's not typical attorney's fees and costs, but it's possible. Uh, 
Now you can enforce what's called a common law trademark and you can enforce what's a, called a registered trademark that we've primarily talked about. It's much, much harder to enforce a common law trademark. And what that means is if you use a name, you just haven't registered it. So patent, you know, patents, um, we talked a little bit about patents, but as I said before, a patent is new, non-obvious and useful. And that's some of the requirements of what's called Section 101 of the, you know, the Patent Act. And it's a monopoly on a certain concept. It's not the right to do something. So you might come up with a concept, and that concept is already patented, at least in part. So maybe, maybe you come up with a unique looking hot tub cover, and you know, the, the hot tub cover is unique and maybe someone else has a patent on the hot tub itself. Obviously, there's not a patent on a hot tub or at least there's not anymore. There's all kinds of manufacturers. But let's say someone had a, a patent on a hot tub and you went along and you got a patent on a hot tub cover. You couldn't necessarily make a hot tub with a hot tub cover, even though you have a patent on the hot tub cover because it builds on top of each other it doesn't give you the right to make it, gets, gives you the right to exclude other people from making it. So it gets a little bit convoluted, complicated, um, but it's the technical thing is it, it gives you a monopoly on the concept, not the right to do it. Uh, patent last uh, 15 or 20 years, depending on what it is. Uh, design patents protect ornamental appearance. Utility patents protect kind of the function, the utility itself. Um, Utility patents are by far more popular than design patents, but design patents are growing in popularity. Um, so let's talk the Lego utility patent. Um, it was, yeah, back in 1958. So 1958, Lego went out, they got a patent on the, the Lego brick, um, developed it, had the monopoly for um, 20 years until 1978. So they, they had it, you know, one of the, interesting points here. So back in 1958, the patents were in the 3 million. So 3,005,282. That, that was the patent number. Patent numbers are sequential. Uh, today we're on over patent 11 million. So that means people are getting much, many, many more patents than they used to. So patents are you know, becoming more popular and there's a lot of technology being developed. The first patent was in 1790. So the time between, you know, patent one and three million is a lot longer than between patent three million and 11 million. So people are doing a lot of patenting. So the, the brick, I should mention this, the brick was a utility patent. It had a function. Um, the Lego design patent, Lego is getting a lot of design patents lately. That's kind of their primary approach, but it protects the appearance. So for example, here you have a shark that looks, uh, looks a certain way. You have a Lego brick with a certain interface on the side. Uh, only other certain other types of bricks can work with that particular brick because of its particular look. Um, ways design patents are used. So phone manufacturers constantly suing each other over certain design patents. Um, you know, an auto manufacturer might patent uh, the look of an alternator in an engine. And they don't do it necessarily because they care about the look of the alternator, but they do it because only certain um, shaped alternators will fit fit with the engine mounts. So if they can control what the alternator looks like and control the production of the alternator, they can make more money doing it. So that was patents. Moving on to copyrights. Uh, copyrights, we do some of these. We certainly have done our share, um, but our focus is not really in the copyright world. Copyright is, is kind of a niche area too. Um, there's a whole industry of copyright trolls out there. You can just go on uh, YouTube and hear all about them. But copyright trolls, uh, copyrights are unique in that most of the time, if you sue someone for copyright infringement, you're going to get your attorney's fees. Uh, so what happens is there's a whole industry of copyright attorneys out there who say, hey, we'll take your case on contingency and we'll get a fee out of the 
out of the defendant and we'll get our attorney's fees. You might get 200 bucks in damages, but we'll get our attorney's fees. So there's copyrights. You gotta be careful in your business. Don't rip off images. If you do, you could be running into a copyright troll. And we've worked with numerous instances of that where someone uses an image, they might even think they have the right to use it, but they use an image and then they get a cease and desist letter. They take it down the next day. It's been up for like five days. Um, but the copyright troll has, has a claim against you and it can put you, put you in a pickle. Uh, but a copyright, you have the right to control the distribution. And uh, it, it's creative work. Uh, it has to be um, you know, put on some tangible form. You know, written, musical, film, paintings, all sorts of the above. It has to be original, has to be creative. So if you just put together a couple shapes and submit it to the copyright office, you're not going to get a, get a, a copyright on that. It has to be creative. And the standard for creative, it's kind of subjective. So it's, it's a little bit gray, but it has to be creative. And it has to be your original thing. A Lego, Lego definitely has some copyrights. Copyrights were part of the throwing people in prison issue we talked about earlier with the, the ripoff. Um, but we see two copyrights here. You know, the, the box itself, that picture on the front of the box, a picture of a boat, some shark, and you know, a bunch of other things on it. Um, Lego has a copyright on the, sh the picture on that box. If you go and take that picture on the box and you reproduce it, you very well might get a cease and desist letter from Lego saying, hey, you're ripping it off our copyright, you're infringing our copyright. Uh, same thing with the, the Lego figurine at the bottom. Um, the way that guy is painted, the way the smile he has, the hair, all these different features, that's a creative, uh, original and creative design fixed on a tangible form. That's probably copyrighted as well. Whether it's registered or not, again, you can have uh, registered copyrights and unregistered copyrights. Registered copyrights are much easy, easy to enforce. Uh, so there's a little bit of a, um, a couple examples of Lego's copyrights. And again, Lego enforces their rights. I want to jump into trade secrets. This is the last type of uh, intellectual property. Um, you know, what a, what a trade secret is, it's just a legal method. You know, everyone knows about secrets, but this is a legal method to keep something secret. And if you follow the rules and you make the reasonable accommodations, reasonable methods, you can sue someone if someone obtains your secret. So to be a trade secret has to be a secret. So if you've shared it with other people, it's not a secret, you can't enforce it. If it doesn't have commercial value, it doesn't fall under a trade secret. And finally, you must take reasonable efforts to maintain the secrecy. And again, that's a little bit subjective. What are reasonable efforts? Uh, but the more you document and have systems that keep something a secret, the better off you're gonna be in terms of proving it. Um, trade secrets can be customer lists, it can be designs, it can be engineering, it can be um, met sales methods, it can be all sorts of different things. Um, so trade secrets, similar to patents in terms of it protects a concept, very common in pretty much all industries, there's different trade secrets out there. So it's, it's something you'll definitely run into. You know, if you hire, if you hire someone from your competitor and they tell you all sorts of stuff about their production, you're very well likely going to be dealing with some level of trade secrets, whether they're actual trade secrets or not hard to say, but it's very possible you'll be dealing with it. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, and as I tell people who come in, my clients, who potential clients, you know, IP is only as good as the business behind it. I strongly believe, you know, you can pay for all sorts of IP you can pay for all sorts of services out there. Um, but it's all just paper until you have a business behind it that makes it worth it. So you have to have your business plan. You have to have something that works. And if you have a method to uh, drive revenue because of your IP and get an ROI on your IP, then it's worth it. 
Uh, so you have to have a good business plan behind what you do in terms of IP. And that goes for more than just IP, but I always tell people, you don't just get a patent, you have a plan as to why you need that patent. So how has Lego done it? Lego has had a good business plan behind their IP and they've enforced it aggressively. You know, I uh, was in communication with one of Lego's attorneys at one point and, you know, he, he said, we were talking about licensing and, and he said, this is one of their sayings. I don't know if this is their slogan, but it's a, it's a saying they use um, from time to time. And it's in, it's in Danish, so I couldn't say it in Danish, but, but what it's translated to is only the best is good enough. And I think that's one of the reasons Lego has done as well as it has from a commercial standpoint, Lego's probably one of the best known um, toy brands in the world. And they've maintained that reputation for 50 plus years. So they've done a very good job at not only have an IP, but also running their business. And they've done it by only doing the best. They've done it by having excellent marketing and they've done it by being consistent, all sorts of things. You could have a whole business review on it alone, but only the best is good enough. And I think they've lived that embodiment and they've been successful in having a great business plan behind their IP. Uh, and that kind of wraps up my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, someone might have. So I'll stop sharing and, and uh, feel free to jump in if you have questions. I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm on my, in the car, so I apologize for the lack of the screen and everything, but um, how much do you recommend pursuing a denied trademark? Like, I think I have some legs on to stand on, but I don't, I'm still trying to figure out if my business is actually gonna go or not. So I'm not sure how much to invest at this point. Yeah, that's, it's, it's tricky. If you, you know, let's say your business was operating and you knew your trademark was worth something, you had really good brand recognition you know, you definitely want to pursue your, your trademark and try to get it. Um, there are different reasons you can get denied a trademark. It might be because of a technical error in the application. It might be because someone else in Florida or Arkansas or wherever has that exact word in its trademark already. And that's going to be very difficult to overcome unless you get them to agree to it. Um, if you're a startup and you're pre-revenue and you put very little money into marketing, you know, it's a much easier decision to make to change your name. So if, if your brand is worth something and you really like it, that's when you want to pursue uh, fighting for the name. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Should we trademark the name and the logo if we i don't know is that just a standard business practice or do we just need to do that if we think that there's potential for copycats so trademarks can really be used in two different ways uh, first you know i guess first to address trademarks you can get trademarks on different things so a name trademark protects a name so let's say you know you want to trademark the name uh, you know, whatever unique name is out there, um, you know, 3D innovation or something. Um, <clears throat> if someone else in Kansas comes up with a name that's the same as yours, 3D innovation systems, you know, you could go to them and say, hey, no, I have a trademark. I want to expand in your market. It protects the name. Let's say you, you know, want to trademark your logo. What the logo protects is how does it look? So if someone comes up with a, a logo that is very similar to yours, confusingly similar, then you could stop them from using that particular logo. Um, you know, trademarks typically can be used in two different ways. You can use it as a sword, you know, uh, going after people who are infringing on you, or you can use it kind of as a shield. So let's say you... You know, you're in North Dakota, maybe you're in Minnesota too, but you're, you're primarily in North Dakota and you have a unique name. You don't want issues in the future. So sometimes what happens is you come up with your name, you've been using it for five years, it's a great name. And then someone in Kansas 
you know, also has been using that same name for 20 years and they think it's a great name. They go and trademark it and they find out about you and they say, hey, you're infringing on our mark. And they send you a cease and desist letter and, and um, you have to go hire an attorney and figure things out. Um, you still have your common law trademark rights and they, they can't necessarily stop you, but it's gonna be a challenge because you have to hire an attorney. You have to go through the process and you have to, you know, basically prove to them that you actually have superior rights than the trademark they filed, which can be expensive. So you can use a trademark as a shield to keep others from, you know, grabbing that name and potentially impacting you down the road. So it's sort of a pay me now or pay me later kind of thing. It very well could be that. And, and it's kind of a, you know, calculated risk. Will that guaranteed happen to you? Probably not. You know, might it happen to you? It could, and that could pay, you know, be much more expensive if it is. Thank you. Absolutely. For a patent, at what point do you recommend filing one if you created a product that you feel is unique? Do you suggest getting it out in the market and selling it first or patenting it first? So there's a couple different considerations with that. So um, it depends on your goals ultimately, but let's say you want to sell internationally. You have to file some sort of application prior to putting it in the public. If you want to go patent this thing in Europe and have international protection in Canada, uh, so forth, and you start selling it before you file a patent application, you can't patent it internationally. And that's just statutory law. You can still get stuff in the United States, but you're barred in the you know international markets. So typically what I say, you know, if, if you think you have something unique, and you want to pursue it, and, but you don't know how far you want to go with it, put a provisional patent on it, give you a year window to at least pursue the idea and to see how much market traction you have. So you have a couple different types of patents. You have a um, provisional patent, which is kind of the starting point, and then you have a non-provisional patent, which you have to file within a year of filing the provisional. And a non-provisional patent is what turns into the patent grant itself. Um, and typically you're gonna start to pursue that non-provisional once you understand, hey, I've got some market traction, I've got some great feedback from you know, people and, and it's gonna be worth it to pursue. Uh, so sooner the better. Uh, in the US, we're in what's called a first to file system. So if two people independently come up with the same idea, the first person to file it with the USPTO gets the right of the monopoly. Um, so that's kind of kind of how it works. When you look at trademarks and copyrights, it's first to use. So if you use it in North Dakota and then someone else trademarks it in Kansas, they can't stop you in your geography. With patents, it's the first one to file gets the right, regardless of whether you invented it five years ago and they invented it yesterday. Anyone else? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Is there a way, let's say you, the original patent, or what did you call the first one? It's called a provisional patent. Provisional patent. Yeah. If you had to adjust, because I, you know, I have a product that I would like to just have people use and see if I need to adjust anything, because there's a lot of parts and pieces that go into it. Are you able to adjust it or how detailed is the patent? Because you kind of want the, the actual full piece done, correct? Yeah, so that's another benefit of a provisional. So, so kind of how it works with a provisional, you put together a disclosure, you submit it to the USPTO. A USPTO doesn't actually look at a provisional, um, but let's say during the year of your provisional, you find out, well, I want to add this feature and that feature and it makes it so much better. You can add that to the non-provisional application. Uh, 
that portion of it doesn't get to refer back to your original priority date when you first filed your provisional, but it does get to be in your non-provisional application and you can pursue it from that perspective. So, so you can add those additional things. It's new matter, so it's not, you know, not the same, same as the original, but you can make those additions. Thank you. So any, any other questions? Tom, what kind of um, trends are you seeing in patent submissions? Is there an industry that's represented a little bit more lately? Uh, what types of applications am I seeing? Yes. Uh, yeah, so we work with, you know, each, you know, different types of patent attorneys specialize in different things. You know, myself, uh, so there's three of us at the law firm who focus on patents. Um, Typically, as a firm, we do a lot of consumer devices. We do a lot of uh, agriculture. We do a lot of oil and gas, uh, medical devices, manufacturing, and automation. So that's you know that's where most of our time is spent. We certainly get into other subject matters, um, but probably the most common is you know a lot of egg, a lot of oil and gas, a lot of consumer devices. You, you know, there's a lot of new software applications out there too. Um, that's more so West Coast and Southern California, uh, but that's certainly certainly a growing trend. Uh, software applications are kind of a tricky thing. Um, you have to deal with subject matter eligibility, which is a conversation in itself. You can't patent formulas, algorithms. Um, you know, abstract ideas and oftentimes the software is in that category, uh, but there's a ton of software and computer related technology out there that people are working on. Okay. Thank you. So, so excellent. Um, yeah, I guess are there any other questions or should I turn it back over to you, Catherine? Great presentation, Tom. Um, one last call. Does anybody have any questions for Tom regarding the USPTO process? Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all so much for attending um, this presentation today. We will be sending a recording to all registered um, for this. And um, Tom, do you have an email address if anybody wants to follow up with you directly? Yes, so my uh, contact information, I, let me see if I can pull up a, I can, I'll paste it in there. Uh, my, my email is tom at fargopatentlaw.com. Um, my address, my, uh, <clears throat> my address for um, law firm www.fargopatentlaw.com. I will drop my contact info in the chat as well. Thank you so much. I just included that there. And thank you all so much for attending today's workshop. We do have a few more workshops in September, and you can find more details at jrecenter.com. I'll also include that in the chat. And with that, uh, we hope that you um, continue to um, also participate in our other innovation series workshops. We will be hosting um, topics on SBIR and STTR grant funding. Later in February, we will be hosting as well a conversation with Gizmonics LLC out of Bismarck on the creativity uh, and innovation process. And uh, we're working on um, hosting a design thinking for entrepreneurs um, sometime in the future months. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Thank you.